afternoon for the Diana Initiative. First off, we're starting with Kaylee McRae, who is a security or privacy engineer, security privacy engineer at Confiant. And today she's pulling back the curtains on some suspicious, potentially scary uh, user behavior and data tracking uh, based on some research she completed. So everybody give a hand for Kaylee McRae. All right, thank you everybody for coming. So I'm Kaylee, I'm a privacy engineer at Confiant, and I've been doing that for, well, Confiant's a cybersecurity startup in the ad tech space. And I've been there for almost three years, so I know ad tech pretty well, and I have looked at a lot of tracking. Um, and I've been a software engineer for about six years, so I know my way around a code base. I'm a cybersecurity nerd and a recovering political science major. Um, so this talk uh, happens to conveniently combine all of my interests. So today, we're going to be talking about Yandex. Yandex is a Russian search giant. It has over 90 different services under its umbrella. It is a massive platform. They own everything. Um, so in January of 2023, almost 45 gigabytes of Yandex source code was leaked on breach forums which has since been shut down by the authorities and bad things happened to them. Um, so Yandex confirmed the leak, but denied that it was a hack and instead blamed it on a former employee. Um, I got involved when a fellow privacy researcher reached out to verify what he had found in a different part of the code base. And after the spending the week digging around, um, trying to verify his findings on a Friday night, I sat down with a glass of wine and just wanted to check out something that I was curious about, um, thinking it would take five minutes. Um, and then what I found was creepy enough that I pinged my boss on the East Coast, and this talk is why I didn't get fired. <laughs> so we are going to go into a little bit more background on the Yandex leak, because Yandex has been going through a lot. Um, we're going to dive into the code. We're going to talk about what it's collecting, what they're doing with it, and who Yandex is sharing that data with. And then we're going to wrap up and hopefully have some time for Q&A. So starting with the background. So for starters, Yandex, Russia's largest search engine. But it also has over 90 services under its umbrella. It has a map service, a browser. It has an email service, um, a cloud service, and smart devices. Sound familiar? So the services that we're going to be focusing on for the purposes of this talk are AppMetrica, which is Yandex's app and web analytics service, uh, Crypto, which does behavioral analytics on user data to generate ad segments for targeting, such as like age, income, interests, what part of the city you live in, and then Audiences, which allows you to use your own data about a target audience, or you can use data from Yandex's AppMetrica service or third-party data providers when you configure ads for Yandex Direct. And you can use these segments for retargeting for ads, or you can just build user profiles. So Yandex is primarily based, most of the, its customers, most of its services are based in Russia, but it's actually owned by Yandex NV, which is based in the Netherlands. So all of that pressure from the EU is also coming to bear here. So. In 2019, Yandex granted this golden share to this Kremlin-linked Public Interest Foundation, or the PIF, to, quote, defend the country's interests. And those interests probably being, according to Putin, preventing the private data of Russian citizens from falling into foreign hands and limiting foreign ownership in strategic tech firms. So the PIF, under this golden share, would have a veto over key company decisions, power to temporarily remove Yandex management, block a potential acquisition, or nominate two permanent board members. So the Kremlin has, for a long time, recognized the very, the importance of Yandex holding a vast amount of user data and has already sought to control where it can be sent. So after Russia invaded Ukraine, in February of 2022, that script began to flip, and the EU began to express concern about Yandex collecting and storing the data of EU citizens and sending it back to Russian servers, where it might be vulnerable to Kremlin abuse. So in this article, Kira Gillies, a senior Russia fellow at the international think tank Chatham House, urged the government to assess the potential threat from Russian tech companies in the UK, 
saying people are not aware of how much data they are spreading around whenever they use an app. The problem arises when it is a hostile state that wishes to cause us damage and is interested in specific individuals they wish to track in this country. So it has the potential to be weaponized against anybody. Do we want, at a time when Russia is considering the UK as an enemy, to be providing our personal data to a server in Moscow? Meanwhile, that same month, privacy researcher Zach Edwards sounded the alarm about Yatmetrica's, uh, sorry, Yandex's app Metrica SDK, sending analytics data back to Russian servers. This SDK, it's included on hundreds of millions of apps globally. Some of these apps are VPNs, which are of course supposed to be protecting your privacy, and apps that target Ukrainian users. Yandex pushed back pretty strongly. They said they asked for consent and that their data is anonymized, but even at the time experts disagreed. They said they just piggybacked on the consent that the apps had without clarifying their specific purpose and usage of this data. And they also said that the data they were collecting could be pretty easily used to re-identify users. Yandex's uh, own at Metrica webpage would also appear to slightly contradict this statement. So it uh, appears pretty ready to provide detailed user profiles on specific individuals. So here was their official statement. Yandex has acknowledged its software collects device, network, and IP address information, but it calls this data non-personalized and very limited. It added, although theoretically possible, in practice it is extremely hard to identify users solely based on such information collected. Yandex definitely cannot do this. Sure, that's a very carefully worded statement. So at the same time, Yandex is facing increased pressure from the Russian government through strict and getting stricter media laws to spread propaganda about the war in Ukraine and then pressure in the form of sanctions on its executives from the EU over spreading that disinformation, not just about Ukraine, but also about opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who said in a series of very spicy tweets that Yandex's claim of displaying news on its homepage was, quote, a solid shameless lie. And according to MIT Tech Review at this time, some 70% of the information on Yandex News was coming from state-controlled media sources pushing propaganda. A former Yandex exec, Bukunov, suggested that Yandex got itself into this mess by being naive to how the tools they were building could be appropriated and gamed by the Russian government. And Yandex, along with a lot of other Russian media companies, decided it was smarter to restructure and sell off these um, very politically inconvenient assets. But it would take it a while. So by April, tens of thousands of engineers have fled the country. According to the MIT Tech Review, government figures show that about 100,000 IT specialists left Russia in 2022, or some 10% of the tech workforce, which is likely a huge underestimate. So Yandex executives have been facing san sanctions from Europe. Earlier, the executive director resigned, and in June, finally, the CEO resigns, which raises a huge question of who is even running Yandex right now. They don't appear to have replaced the CEO. It appears to be run by the board. So Yandex finally, in August, succeeds in selling its news, Zen, and very surprisingly, the homepage Yandex.ru to this Russian state-controlled social media company, VK, in exchange for sole ownership of VK's food delivery app. Um, if you go to yandex.ru now, it redirects to dzen.ru. Um, the delay in sale and also the seemingly very unfavorable terms of the sale uh, are rumored to be the result of that golden share that gave the state the power to veto any potential deal. So it's not clear now what happened to the user data from Yandex that those apps had access to now that they are owned by the state-controlled company. So Yandex's holding company by November decides to just sell the whole thing. <laughs> they announced their plans to divest ownership and control of most of Yandex Group and said in a statement that they were reviewing options to restructure the group's ownership and governance in light of the current geopolitical environment. And at the same time, um, Kremlin ally Alexei Kudrin, who's a former finance minister, uh, agreed to become the Yandex advisor on corporate development to advise on restructuring, which further tightened the Kremlin's control on Yandex. And right now it looks like Yandex is uh, 
essentially being run by a few board members and this guy. So back to this leak. In January 2023, finally, the source code was leaked on breach forums, and the software engineer, Arseny Shestikov, confirmed from, confirmed from current and past Yandex employees that the leak is real, and it reflects code that they said likely dated back to the start of the war on Ukraine, which would mean that someone effectively archived this data the day Russia invaded Ukraine and then held onto it for 11 months for whatever reason. But remember that the breach forums post said it dated back to July of 2022, and I actually found Jupyter Notebooks in Crypto's analysis section that have some, um, shall we say, lingering data outputs from test environments, it looks like not prod, and some of the test data dates to July 2022, which would appear to line up with this and suggests that it's um, slightly newer than originally suggested. Um, Yandex, again, they confirmed the leak, um, but they dismissed that it was a threat to its users or its performance because no real user data was released. And now we have an opportunity to test the claims that Yandex made about AppMetrica's data collection. So as of now, Yandex still up for sale. So in June, Putin, because again, they have this golden share, they have to approve everything, um, approved a bid from this consortium of billionaires, read oligarchs, and VTB Bank, but that got vetoed by Yandex's foreign investors, partly because they have to find someone who can buy Yandex and not be subject to sanctions, which at this point, that's a pretty narrow pool of people. And then there's this really recent Russian regulation that says that foreigners selling their Russian assets have to do so at a discount of at least 50%. And there's an additional 10% tax on that. Um, so if a deal can't be reached, which, I mean, there are very narrow options for reaching a deal at this point, nationalization is reportedly very much on the table. So again, in June, tensions are still continuing despite Kutrin apparently running this company. Yandex was fined 2 million rubles in Russian court for refusing to share user data with security services. Um, a stand which will probably be moot once any Kremlin-approved deal goes through or, you know, a full-on nationalization happens. So let's get into this code. So the code in the Yandex leak, it's broken down by service or application. It's written in a mix of Russian and English, and researchers have reportedly noted uses of racist language in the comments. And a lot has already been published about, like, its SEO rankings. People are very curious about that. Found that it scraped Google. Uh, I found in um, some of the crypto analysis sections that they compare um, conversions for themselves versus Google, so there's definitely, in their minds, they're pretty fixated. Um, so this uses a variety of coding languages, pretty much all of them, but primarily Python, C++, and something called YQL, Yandex Query Language, which is a flavor of SQL. Um, and this is just the code itself. It, they didn't release a Git repository, and that like we don't have the version history. Um, and aside from those Jupyter notebooks, we don't really have any data outputs. So I can say what the code does, but I can't say for sure how often or that it was actually used. Disclaimer. So I sorted through this metric on crypto source code manually, but there are lots of portions of the code I haven't gotten into yet. So let's look at Metrica. So the server side at Metrica data is in a service called Metrica, which in, with a K, which encompasses the data from the mobile SDK and then um, Metrica, which is this desktop analytics service. So these are just some of the raw data fields that at Metrica logs. And remember that Yandex told the Financial Times that the data it collects is non-personalized and very limited? Um, sure. Um, so you can see at the top that it is going into something called an anonymizer, but it, nothing about this level of detail is anonymized clearly at this point in, Yand in AppMetrica's servers. And you're going to see from how it's used that that anonymization is somewhat irrelevant. So to start with, these unique IDs are getting hashed, and that's lovely, and theoretically anonymizing. But they're still going to be very unique, um, especially because these hashes are going to add all kinds of entropy. Um, and therefore uniquely identifying because it's going to make them very easy to match probabilistically with other data about this device as it comes in. Because all you have to do is hash any incoming identifiers and see if the outputs match. Um, but whatever, and that is how anonymization is supposed to work. Um, it's still supposed to be very functional. So whatever this anonymization is supposed to accomplish, though, um, the way they use it renders it pretty meaningless. 
So in addition to that, AppMetrica is taking in some really precise location data. Uh, it's not that uncommon for app analytics to take in latitude and longitude because you want to be able to see if you're a product or growth team where people are using your app. But what's not very normal is taking in a user's altitude, direction, and speed, which together with this timestamp gives you a pretty disturbingly accurate picture of a user's movements. And unless the app you're using is something like Pokemon Go or a run tracker, there aren't a lot of use cases that justify that, especially not for a product or growth team who are supposed to be at Metrica's target users. Um, with this information, if someone was using your app on an airplane, you could see how high it's flying, how fast it's going, and in what direction, and probably predict where it's going next, which, I don't know, seems like overkill. So let's take a quick look at how ineffective that anonymization gets with these fields. So a Wi-Fi SSID, if you don't know, is essentially the name of a Wi-Fi network. So if you are connected to the hotel or conference network right now, that would be your SSID. So over in crypto, we have these same fields again. So straight out of Metrica, we have the device ID, we have the original device ID, whatever that means. Um, whether either of these fields are hashed or not at this point is unclear, um, and you'll realize as we go kind of irrelevant. Um, so here are those exact fields again, and thanks to the hashed or unhashed uh, device ID, they are attached to a unique identifier. And here, both the device ID and SSID are being matched to a Yandex ID. Now, one possible motive to select both is that an SSID might have multiple devices associated with it, which can help you clarify relationships between devices. It might be a user with multiple devices, it might be a household or a group of coworkers. Essentially, if you connect to the same Wi-Fi network, they assume you are connected. The important thing here is that these are being associated with this Yandex ID. So here we have identifiers that come in through a click event, and they're being matched with any IDs, hashed or unhashed, to two ways um, until a match is found in a system so that event can then be associated with the correct consumer or household data and all of the pre-existing data that's been collected about them. So for example, it complains the plate, it compares the plain Android ID, that MD5 hash, and an SHA1 hash, neither of which are terribly effective or standardized hashes at this point. Um, and then it uh, also looks at this fingerprint, which is generated using some of the raw fields that we looked at, like client IP and OS version, um, which is pretty standard for a fingerprint. You're supposed to take device information, put it all into a dictionary, hash that thing until you come out with a very unique identifier that can be used to really easily identify that device's signature when you encounter it in the future without having to drop a cookie. So. Even after anonymization, this data is still very functional, effective, and um, being used to identify matches. So then as this new information comes in, they use it to update user sociodemic attributes that they already have. So the basic attributes shown here, and this is just like a small example, um, are age band, which is a nice little gesture at privacy for generalization. <laughs> but they do have exact age in other parts of the system, so sort of pointless. Um, and sex, they only use male or female, and all of this is associated with that device ID, which has to get hashed, you can see at the bottom here, before it's sent over the buffer, suggesting that it was probably processed and stored unhashed, which is pretty inconsistent and, you know, sort of renders all previously, previous attempts at hashing and anonymization uh, pointless. So also in Metrica, they have this uh, code related to Yandex audiences product, which allows users to generate segments for targeted advertising or user profiles, again, using this data from AppMetrica or third-party data brokers or uploading their own data. Uh, in the first two cases, the customers who end up in those segments don't have to have used the customer's product because it can be used to generate fresh leads. So you can use Yandex audiences to get information on people who never, ever, ever used your product before. Let's look at crypto. So what is it? It is Yandex's behavioral analytics service. It's supposed to create demographic segments for very specific ad targeting, specifically for Yandex ads in theory. Um, and it takes data points from all over Yandex's services, which you've seen are many. Um, and it combines it all with inferences determined from analyzing all this behavioral data to create very holistic profiles, which it uses to create very specific ad segments. And part of the reason that it takes in data from all over Yandex's services is that Yandex ads then advertises all over Yandex's services. So 
If you're using Yandex Navigator and you get stopped in traffic, then they will show you an ad, which they swear is completely safe. So here are some examples of the segments that Crypto generates, and we're gonna zoom in on a little section here. So smokers, um, this seems to track users who purchase specific smoking products, nothing exciting, just tobacco, e-cigarettes, et cetera. Summer residents, which uses geolocation data to tra track whether users have dashas, which are Russian summer homes, and then how often they visit them. And then we're gonna look at a few more of these. So travelers, this uses geolocation data again to track when you've gone from your main region, which they've already determined from all of the other aggregated data they have about you, to another region, and whether it was domestic or international travel. Mail data appears to pull from email data, because again, Yandex has an email service, to track whether you have any boarding passes, plane tickets, or hotel confirmations. This gas station segment seems to process where you bought gas. Um, in, the, in the very literal visited a gas station sense, I don't even know if gas stations have home pages, um, but they know whether you visited the actual gas station. So if Yandex can make these segments, it seems pretty plausible that they could take pretty much the exact same data and create a segment like young men of military age planning to leave Russia very quickly, or generate segments based around vices or blackmail, which they're not doing now but when they become <laughs> state controlled, that seems certainly like a thing they might wanna do. So these are the bones of machine um, learning model training. Um, and they seem to leverage some first party data because they know whether you did business at that legal office or showed up to your medical clinic appointment or bought something at the pharmacy when they track these so-called deep conversions. And this is a very basic example of a household composition stored in crypta. Um, it has household ID, size, gender, any elderly, which they have unfortunately called has old, um, any children, uh, but of course they have much more precise information than that, which we've already seen. So once again, we have at Metrica data associated with device ID being used to pull that Wi-Fi information, which they are obsessed with. Um, this time they're tracking connection types to do a very specific segment. And then again, at Metrica SSIDs are being used for processing here, and it looks like it's to deduplicate user records associated with a common Wi-Fi access point. So here are some examples of data pools that Crypto uses for processing for the purposes of its fuzzy matching in graphs. You can see they have email login information, another source of emails. The geolocation for home and work locations, household information, Rickans is um, basically their search data and the analysis they've done on it, and Wi-Fi SSIDs, um, as always. And so, Crypto pulls this email and login information and it associates it with a Yandex ID. So if you connect any so-called anonymized data from AppMetrica to a Yandex ID, Crypto can associate it with email and login information, which pretty effectively re-identifies it, which is very convenient for law enforcement. And here we have Crypto just like shamelessly scraping for every kind of identifier it can apparently think of. Yandex uses this passport system. Um, it essentially creates one Yandex login to rule them all, and it logs you in across all Yandex apps and services. And this form takes first name, last name, and phone number, and Crypto has some of this data. It can definitely take a passport user ID and match it to a phone number. And you can see they have, as a source type, passport profile, which would imply that they have access to the rest of that profile as well, which if you recall had first and last name. Now I didn't find any example of them using it, but it um, sure seems like a thing they could do. Uh, and now you see they also have passport phone dump, which would imply that they are just shamelessly scraping all of these <laughs> phone <laughs> numbers into one massive data pile. Cool. Uh, so here's some test mockup data for passport functions in Crypta. Uh, we have the passport user ID, the login no name, and sure enough, some phone numbers and some just like really weird names. I don't know what they were doing. So one of the things that happens in graphs is that they process the latitude and longitude of your predicted home, which is processing they've already done. They associate it with your Yandex ID and everything that's already associated with that, which is a lot. And then they plot it on a geograph which they then use to find and plot your literal neighbors, not just your K neighbors, 
and their Yandex user IDs and all of the association, the information associated with those IDs. Here we have two Yandex products being used to do Encrypta in a super creepy way. Uh, no method needs to be called extract children from taxi. That is so creepy. Um, it just sounds horrible. So this is part of a very long process um, that involves pulling children and ages from the search data based on visits to certain sites, and then from App Metrica, and then on the taxi app, and then pulling it all together to create a very holistic profile of how many children are in a given household. And if you zoom in on that last section, you can see that once you have one kind of ID, whether it's household, passport, crypto ID, Yandex ID, you have them all, um, transitively anyway. Um, and all of the identifying data associated with them, which you know is email address, phone number, um, household data, geo data, um, pretty effective for re-identification. So yeah, crypto profiles also integrate biometric data, and I'm pretty sure they're from these smart speakers that use Yandex's Alice Smart Assistant, which is supposed to be able to interact appropriately with your children um, and play little games with them and make up little fairy tales. And crypto uses voice biometric data to identify children and their age range by voice to further build out the household's uh, profile for use in ads. That voice biometric data is presumably from this Alice product. And it's not unreasonable for a voice activated device to, that is supposed to be able to interact appropriately with children to be able to identify their voices. That makes sense. But this isn't within the Alice app. This data is being sent outside of that app, outside of that function, and outside of those original purposes into crypta for behavioral analytics. And Crypto has a UA portal to display some of this household and user profile information. Now, I don't know where this portal lives. It's possible it's part of audiences. It's possible it's part of something else um, because AppMetrica has, as an analytics product, its own uh, sort of dashboard on the other side. So it's not clear where this actually lives, but they certainly have the code to display this. So this basic user information card, um, it shows marital status, income, has children, and icons for three interests, which if you're wondering what those are, pretty innocent. Food, gifts, rests, all reasonable interests. And you can search these individual profiles by Crypta or Yandex ID, which suggests that they are not just aggregating these segments. You can search for more information about individual consumers if you have access to their IDs, which presumably, if you're generating segments, you would. And this is a list of available app icons that um, can be associated with this profile. Um, in case you still had any doubt somehow that Yandex is pulling data from all of its apps into these profiles. And Yandex also appears to be able to associate all of these IDs, which are many, to social media accounts with Instagram, Facebook, and VK, which if you remember is Russia's uh, social media site. So you can see they have email Yandex ID, iOS and Android IDs, logins, passport user ID again, all of this associated with social media accounts. Now we're gonna look at the matcher section. So matcher is a section of Crypto's code that syncs fingerprinting events with five, well, four major Russian telecoms providers and then Intent AI, which is sort of adjacent. Um, outside of Yandex's own assets. And one of these providers that they're syncing this fingerprinting data with is Ross Telecom, which is a Russian state-owned and run company that also happens to provide broadband service to Crimea. This means that fingerprinting events that are synced with this provider through Crypta could be accessible to parts of the Russian state, which makes one wonder what they were resisting over there with the security services in that court case. So this is Ross Telecom's matcher. Pretty, pretty much what you would expect. They build a connection to the Ross Telecom API, they pass in this fingerprinting event, and then on Ross Telecom's side, they take in the data that was sent over, which is a little bit of a fingerprint, and then they search their own system to find a match, and then they send back their own external ID and data that they have on that user. And this is an example of the test data for what the process is supposed to return. You can see it's sort of half a log event, half a fingerprint, and it involves that new external ID and the source it came from. 
So this is an example of user syncing, which is fairly common in ad tech. Um, not fairly common to sync with state-owned uh, telecoms providers, but it's a process. All right, so wrap up time. So this is just a small example of what they have and what they can use that to determine. And remember, they have a UI to display this information, and they're probably about to be state controlled. So these Metrica SDKs give Yandex a very broad and global reach of data subjects. Remember, we're talking hundreds of millions of apps and all of the users of those apps. And Yandex has been, to put it mildly, very evasive and misleading about how that data is used. Sure, you can't solely re-identify that data, perhaps. I mean, you can, actually. Uh, but perhaps not solely, based on the information they collect. But even if that were true, they associate it with tons of other re-identifying information throughout this processing in crypto, which very effectively re-identifies it at several points. And then, you know, the data that they are collecting is actually kind of disturbing on the face of it, but you know, it's also kind of interesting what a very small amount of data can say about you once it's been matched um, to all of the other data they have about you and all of those other sources and analyzed. And then we have this matcher process, which is pretty clear evidence that already, even before nationalization, at least some of the data that Yandex is collecting could easily be synced with Russian state-owned entities. So. Yandex makes a few token gestures towards anonymization, and that's lovely. But they are pretty ineffective because hashing isn't used consistently. Um, and more importantly, they collect data that could easily re-identify a user and make sure that it is all firmly associated with the so-called anonymized data. They refer to it as gluing through this chain of IDs. So if your company runs an app, pay attention to who's actually running your SDKs what data points they are collecting and where they are sending your users' data. Because Yandex, when cornered, claimed that it got consent through the apps. And it claimed that it only gets the apps that app developers choose to send it, laying the blame squarely at app developers' doorstep and not their own. And if you're a consumer, know that nothing really stays harmless forever. Maybe you're comfortable with your, an app having your data now, but what happens when your app gets bought by a company that you don't trust? or it's headquartered in a country that goes to war <laughs> in a way that is not aligned with you or your values, or their government starts making very concerning demands to turn over user data. This is not just a Russia problem. This is you know, a very international apps question. They have no borders, and it's sort of the, the final frontier of, of data vulnerabilities. All right, so here I take you to some useless um, codes because I'm not allowed to release this data till August 10th. But theoretically, if you follow them, the data will be there <laughs> on August 10th when I can finally release it. So apologies there. Um, but uh, any Q&As? Yeah. So, um, a, a very interesting talk, so thank, so thank you for that. There's also been some uh, talk about what TikTok is doing, and it always strikes me because I, I think they're only doing what Facebook and Instagram and others are doing, and um, I just wondered if you could compare that to, to say what they're, you know, what uh, Yandex is, is doing. And why or why not we should be concerned? Because, I mean, our government can just as easily take that data from those those U.S.-based sources and do innocuous things with it. So. Yeah, and not so innocuous things. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the big difference between Yandex and all of the um, other companies that are doing similar things is that Yandex's code got leaked. Um, so I can't say, for legal reasons, uh, you know, what those apps are doing, because I don't straightforwardly know, but honestly, I assume it's not that different. And I mean, there have been, if you follow privacy news in Europe, um, 
Europe's very aware of the problem of the U.S. government having potentially access to all of the data being collected by companies that are headquartered in the U.S. And that's why we have that big um, uh, Schrems 1, 2, 3 through 10. I don't know. It'll probably go on forever. Um, every time we try to send up, set up a privacy shield to send data between these apps and, and Europe, uh, it gets taken down by a court case that says essentially that, like we don't know what the U.S. is going to do with that, and and so it's sort of like, you know, the big reason we are picking on Yandex is because Russia. Um, the big reason we are picking on TikTok is because China, and and that certainly comes right back at us in the same way. I just don't understand why people aren't as upset with Facebook and Instagram and Google as they are with these others. It's like to me, it's no different. Yeah, it definitely feels like a very political, um, a, a politically aligned situation where they, it's a proxy war of sorts. And I mean, that's both on the perception of consumers and also the very real fact that like they're collecting data and they can do a lot of scary things with it and then who knows what they're sharing it with. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And Bard couldn't even be used there for a while. I think they fixed that, but I don't know for sure. That's it's an ongoing thing. <laughs> it's been, it is an ongoing thing. It will continue to be an ongoing thing. All right. Anything else? So, oh, privacy issues. How how long did you like? take to dive into this uh, code and, and like just in, in general, like how long did this process take? So um, a few hours with a glass of wine that Friday night and then I pinged my boss and then uh, we went through it and it was mostly one night and then we weren't sure if we had anything. <laughs> so we kind of paused, we are like, is this, is this enough? Is this creepy enough? And then I started submitting it and then I like went in and really, really, really dug through and that process. Um, Took a few weeks, I don't know. ADHD is its own little superpower. Uh, breadth, not depth, right? So <laughs> there, there are so many portions of the Yandex source code that I'm sure contain even freakier things that I just didn't um, have a chance to dig into yet. But who knows, maybe next year I'll be back with something weirder. So that was the question I was going to ask. So now, I know you said you didn't go through everything, but what would be your, if you had all the time in the world, right? If what would be only. your next steps in terms of advancing this research, whether within this code or other, you know, other tools and stuff? Um, great question. I, I think that um, the next uh, creepiest things would most likely be in Alice. Because um, we, we already saw what it's doing with children's voice data and it's like you have to do a lot of analytics to make something like that function and you have to do that on biometric data and that's always the sort of tricky thing. That line when you're a software developer you're like oh my god look at this cool thing you can do and then you build this tool that can be used for evil um, and then someone else gets control over it. And I think that's the, the situation Yandex you know, has accidentally found itself in. You had well-meaning developers who were trying to build something cool um, and, and building this empire, and then it got uh, gamed really hard. And they left the country. Yes, most of them left the country, it certainly looks like. Um, so I, I think, uh, yeah, and Passport probably has lots to say, and then the email platform, because they were getting that data somehow for the when they're checking for boarding passes and whatnot, and I would love to know how they're doing that. But, I mean, they, again, over 90 apps and services. There are so many to choose from. So many. And, I mean, I don't know if the, I know breach forms got taken down. Um, I don't know if the BitTorrent got taken down, but if you all want to dig in, too, it's out there. We hear a lot about uh, ransomware actors and Russia and all that sort of stuff. Is there any evidence that you found that there's parts of um, the population they're omitting or they're purposely not looking at? 
Can you repeat that? I missed parts of it, sorry. Oh, just the, we always hear connections about the Russian government and ransomware actors. So I'm curious when you find something like this that's tracking purposefully, mm. is it also places it's, tra it's not tracking purposefully? Interesting. Um, I didn't find any obvious or exciting links to ransomware, or I would have yelled about it by now. Um, but I, I mean, it would sure be interesting to find, is what I'll say about that. Like, I, I don't uh, think it's impossible, but I don't think they would be that obvious either. Ah. Oh, I see what you're saying. I think there is something, and I mean, this is like the depths of my memory, and I don't know if it's accurate, but I do think there's something in search results about that, but it's less like don't track and more like, hmm. Oh. Yeah, especially Ukraine. There isn't, um, and I was looking out for it. I think there may be in other parts of the code, um, and that's something we need this uh, research I was originally supposed to be verifying. Uh, I think he had something close to it, um, but he needs to publish his stuff, which is a whole other, not my problem. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it's there. Ross Telecom um, has a broadband contract, or has a contract to provide broadband service in Ukraine and Crimea. So there's something there, but I didn't find anything specifically flagging it. Not in this portion anyway. Are there any tools or frameworks now or forthcoming that you find interesting to combat this kind of abuse of uh, the exploit of user agency and user data against users? Uh, I think the real, um, I mean, that's the really frustrating thing about this SDK is, you know, most of the things you would point to if you're like a privacy researcher trying to give advice are things that had that SDK, in, SDK installed in it. And so what it really comes down to is looking at those uh, App Store and Google Store declarations and the battle to make those transparent and accurate and get people to actually digest that information. Um, and think about what they're sending. And that, that is sort of the thing is like, so I use One Medical, um, and I love them. I have a great GP through them. Uh, they have so much personal medical information, because duh. Um, and that was cool, and then they got bought by Amazon. You know, so it's that thing of like, well, I trust this company now, because I have this relationship with them, and then, and then what happens to that data if that relationship changes? Um, we theoretically have the power, at least if you're in California or Europe where you are protected by a privacy law, or you will be in the next few months when a bunch of U.S. states kick theirs in, um, where you should be able to send a data deletion request and sort of yank back some of that data. But um, there's debate about where this boundary lies, but you can pull back the raw data, but not necessarily the analytics that were built, uh, that it was used to build because it's the company's work product. And so you can kind of claw back your raw data, but there's a lot that they'll always have on you even after you do that. And that's assuming that they like um, tracked uh, how they did that correctly and actually successfully pulled all that raw data, which is a whole other thing, <laughs> especially with anonymization, where it's like you do it too well and then you can't do the privacy thing, which is weird. All right, I think we are hitting time, but does, any more questions? If not, I will be running around out here for the next few hours. How can we connect with you? Oh, um, on the Twitters? Uh, let me scroll on back. So that is my Twitter at this point. like. I have a mastodon that I don't use and a threads that I don't, you know what I mean. That's the only one thing I use consistently. I'm sorry, X? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> yes, or uh, you have my name, find me on LinkedIn. They haven't done anything to offend me yet so far. So still using that.